Southern Fried True Crime covers cases that are not suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. In this episode, suicide is discussed as well. Listener discretion is strongly advised. When a celebrity dies young, as a culture, we grieve excessively and often intrusively to their families, especially if it's by violence. We seem to feel like the people we put on pedestals are immune to the depressingly common tragedies we see in the news every day. Even the tragedies that fascinate us in the true crime genre seem too mundane for our idols. Last weekend, the 4th of July was the 12th anniversary of the murder of football legend and Nashville hero, Steve McNair. From the day his body was discovered, his death was embroiled in controversy. Because the married family man was killed in a murder-suicide with his girlfriend in a bachelor pad he kept in the city. The unseemliness of his infidelity quickly tarnished his well-earned legacy. Within weeks, there was even more ugliness over his estate because he died without a will. Within months, the conspiracy theories started and have lingered for more than a decade. What looked like an open and shut case came under question as friends of his young girlfriend flocked to the media. Soon rumors were flying about more than McNair's love life. An ex-police officer, claiming to just be searching for the truth, opened a very public investigation, calling on the NPD to reopen the case. There was a long-form podcast sponsored by Sports Illustrated about McNair's case, released in 2018, but it left more questions than answers. Because of all of the rumors and innuendo, many fans still aren't sure about the official police ruling. Many can't or won't accept that an icon like Steve McNair could be killed for one of the oldest reasons known to man. They need conspiracy theories to feed on. Fan forums either trash McNair for being unfaithful or trash his wife for having to protect his assets in court. The legacy of a truly gifted athlete will forever be overshadowed by his infidelities, gossip, and conspiracy theories. After all, when a titan falls, we want it to be with honor in the glory of battle. Welcome to episode 123, the controversial murder of football legend Steve McNair. I feel like we've talked about Music City and the history of Nashville in several episodes. You obviously know it's famous for country music, home to the Ryman Auditorium, the Country Music Hall of Fame and Museum, as well as the Belcourt Theater. And of course, the Grand Ole Opry, which was originally located in the Ryman, which along with its incredibly beautiful architecture, gave rise to its nickname, the Mother Church of Country Music. Nashville is also known as the Athens of the South, because it's home to 24 universities. Athens, the ancient city of learning and site of Plato's Academy, was an inspiration for the full-scale replica of the Athenian Parthenon in Nashville. The Parthenon was built in 1897 and lies in Centennial Park, which is about two miles west of downtown Nashville. Today, Nashville is growing and changing at a speed that is upsetting to many natives, who are being priced out of their hometown. It's also living up to its other nickname of Nash Vegas, as it's a popular destination for bachelor and bachelorette parties. With five blocks of honky-tonk bars and clubs, with live music and no cover charge, it is definitely party central, even beyond the ubiquitous bridal woo-girl party wagons. The pandemic definitely hurt Nashville's $7 billion tourism industry. But as experts predicted, it's bouncing back. It was slow to respond to COVID restrictions, with the bar scene criticized nationally last summer when the COVID death toll was rising at a horrific rate. Bar owners sued the mayor for financial losses, even though so many bars and clubs ignored restrictions, with maskless partiers flaunting all over social media in these popular establishments. The Titans were also mired in controversy during the pandemic when the NFL sued the team for $350,000 
for one of the worst COVID outbreaks in the league last October. Y'all know I don't really want to be negative about Nashville, but I will always be honest, and that is recent Nashville history. But we're about to take a look back to over a decade ago with today's case, when we lost Nashville hero and the legendary Titans MVP, Steve McNair. I'll give you a brief overview of the Tennessee Titans and later Steve's history with the team. Originally known as the Houston Oilers, the team's history began in 1960 in Houston, Texas, as part of the Southern Division of the American Conference of the National Football League. After playing in a renovated high school stadium for almost eight years, in 1967, the team moved into the Houston Astrodome. After a promising start, winning the AFL championship two years in a row in 1960 and 61, the Oilers struggled despite enthusiastic fan attendance at the new stadium. They gained a bit of traction in the 80s, but by the early 90s, the team was plagued with internal coaching and staff issues. By 1996, the team had a new coach, Jeff Fisher, who shifted the Oilers' success in a major way, in large part thanks to the draft pick in 1997 of quarterback Steve Ayer McNair. Steve McNair would go on to make history not only for himself, but for his team as well. Before he became the football star of the Tennessee Titans franchise, Steve McNair was a loving son, brother, and husband. Stephen Latrell McNair was the fourth of five sons born to Selma and Lucille McNair in Mount Olive, Mississippi on Valentine's Day in 1973. Mount Olive is a tiny town with a population that's never risen over a thousand and where over 30% of the residents live below the poverty level. Steve's father apparently wasn't in the picture much because Lucille raised her five sons on her own. She struggled as a single mom, and while they might not have had a lot of money, they had a lot of love. Steve was very close to his mother and his four brothers, Fred, Jason, Michael, and Tim. Lucille worked long nights to support her family, and without her knowledge, her boys, including Steve and his oldest brother, Fred, were playing football. Football wasn't what Lucille thought her boys should be spending time on. She wanted her sons to focus on school and have a strong foundation with church. But it wasn't long before her sons started showing promise in the stadium. Both Fred and Steve showed a natural talent for the game. Fred joined the Mount Olive High School team, donning the number nine on his jersey, the number Steve would later use throughout his professional career. By the time Steve was a student at Mount Olive High, he was playing football, basketball, and baseball for the school. Steve had an absolute passion for athletics, and his talent matched his passion from an early age. He was named All-State and Super Prep All-American as a quarterback and defensive back. He quickly caught the attention of college recruiters. Though he was successful at football, Steve also had skills on the diamond and like many quarterbacks, had a real knack for baseball. As graduation neared, he was noticed by a scout for the Seattle Mariners baseball team. The Mariners invited Steve and a handful of other high school standouts to a private practice. Steve was selected by the Mariners as their draft pick, receiving an offer to play for the team right out of high school with the promise of $15,000 and a college scholarship. The opportunity, in Steve's mind, was almost too good to pass up. He wanted to provide for his mom and family and felt this was a great opportunity. But Lucille McNair wanted something more for her son, telling him, like she told his four brothers, God comes first, books come second, and their sports come next. She encouraged him to follow in his brother's paths of attending the historically black university, Alcorn State in Mississippi where he could play football and immediately start his education. After consideration, Steve declined the Mariners' offer and enrolled at Alcorn State in 1991. Lucille would later give an interview and say that it wasn't just her influence that schools should come first. Steve wanted to get his education, but he wanted to play quarterback, and while he received offers from other colleges to play a defensive lineman, 
Alcorn was the only school that offered him a scholarship to play as quarterback. As a quarterback at Alcorn, he became the first player in collegiate history to accumulate 16,000 yards of total offense, set five NCAA records, and additional 31 Division I AA records. He was in the New York Times, ESPN, Washington Post, and he made the cover of Sports Illustrated with the caption, Hand Him the Heisman. His classmates even wrote a rap song for his Heisman campaign. Steve wound up finishing third in the 1994 race for the Heisman Trophy. Before Steve met his future wife, he had sons with two other women, Steve McNair Jr. in 1991 and Stephen O'Brien Corin McNair in 1994. Katina Fiesel was the mother of his first son, Steve McNair Jr., and they had dated from the seventh grade all the way up through high school. She would later describe him to a Sports Illustrated journalist as fun, silly, and a good guy, although she also said guys will be guys, meaning he had cheated on her. She had their son right after they graduated from high school in 1991. Steve met Sheila McNair, no relation, the mother of his second son through mutual friends. She said he was the perfect gentleman and initially followed him to Alcorn State but admitted to Sports Illustrated journalist Tim Rowan that she loved him because she was the jealous type. She gave birth to Stephen, known as Lil Stephen, in 1994. Tim Rowan did a long-form podcast on the Steve McNair case for Sports Illustrated in the fall of 2018, called The Fall of a Titan. It received mixed reviews, mainly because it reported on a lot of rumors without answering questions, but it did have interviews with many people who were close to Steve, one of which was his professor at Alcorn State, Dr. Alvin Simpson, later known as Doc Simpson, who became close to Steve and his whole family, including his mother, known as Mama Mac. Most of his friends, including Doc and the mothers of his first two sons, are very frank about Steve's womanizing. It started early on. It was incredibly rare that a country boy from Alcorn State could achieve what Steve did on the football field and garner that kind of national spotlight. People showed up to watch Alcorn games the way they would follow big teams like Auburn and Crimson Tide or LSU. Instead, fans were flocking to see the new phenom quarterback, Steve Ayer McNair, at little-known Alcorn State. His teammates, friends, manager, all agree that because of his fame and notoriety, women threw themselves at Steve McNair. I'm going to pause now for a short commercial break. Despite all the attention Steve got from women, he was only serious about one girl during college. She was a dancer on the same field he played on a member of the Alcorn State Golden Girls, but he said he wasn't really aware of her as a dancer. Steve met Michelle Cartwright in an anatomy class at Alcorn State. He made funny faces at her in class, found excuses to talk to her, and tried anything to get the lovely young woman's attention. Michelle had a boyfriend at the time, but Steve eventually began to grow on her. She wasn't interested in football and didn't particularly care that Steve was the school's big-shot quarterback. It wasn't his success on the field that won Michelle over. Instead, she told ESPN how she saw Steve as a gentle giant, someone who was tough on the field, but sweet, kind, and generous to the people in his life. Friends would later insist that Michelle knew about Steve's womanizing ways. His first two sons were no secret, and Michelle was no fool, but she loved him. After graduating, Michelle and Steve moved to Houston, Texas, where in 1995, after being drafted third overall for the Houston Oilers, Steve became the highest drafted black quarterback in NFL history at that time. When Steve was drafted and got his first big check, he bought his mother some land, 645 acres in an area she was very familiar with. She had grown up there picking cotton. Her father had been a sharecropper. It was a monumental moment for mother and son. He built her a six-bedroom ranch house on the land. 
Steve spent most of the first two years with the Oilers, learning from his teammates and coach, Jeff Fisher. In June of 1997, Michelle and Steve married in Vicksburg, Mississippi, at Michelle's hometown church, and shortly after, the newlyweds moved with the Houston Oilers franchise to Tennessee, where the team was relocating. The now Tennessee Oilers settled in Memphis and were set to play at the Liberty Bowl. This change of scenery was not without its complications, though. Local Memphians were not enthused by the team's debut at Liberty Bowl with rumors that the team was headed for Nashville anyway. The team had a hard time filling seats with their own fans, despite early successes at their new home field. I actually saw the Oilers play the Steelers in Memphis, and I can confirm. It was hard watching all the terrible towels as we sat on the mostly empty side. It's kind of funny to think about it now, but team owner Bud Adams and ESPN were actually shocked that Nashvillians didn't want to drive three hours to Memphis to see their team play. The following year, the 1998 season was played at Vanderbilt Stadium in Nashville, while construction was underway for their official stadium. By 1999, the team's name was changed to the Tennessee Titans and a new logo was designed. A white ring with flames symbolized the sun with three stars to honor the Tennessee flag surrounding the letter T in the shape of a sword. Naming the new Nashville team was such a big deal. People had bumper stickers on their cars with their vote. The name the Titans was chosen to honor Nashville's powerful nickname as the Athens of the South. The NFL coming to Nashville really changed the culture and energy of the city. Also in 1999, Michelle McNair gave birth to their first child together, a baby boy named Tyler. Five years later, their son Trent was born. And by 1999, Nissan Stadium, the home of the Tennessee Titans, was complete. As quarterback, Steve McNair led his team to the 1999 playoffs and then to Super Bowl 34 in January of 2000. The Titans lost to the St. Louis Rams by just a single touchdown, 23-16. Passionate fans of the Titans will point out that it wasn't just one touchdown, but it was missed by one yard. One yard, they still cry. It was a heartbreaking loss for Nashville's new fans, and sadly, it would be the only Super Bowl game the Titans have played since. But Steve's success with the team continued. In 2003, McNair was selected as the co-MVP, along with Peyton Manning, making history again as the first black player to hold the title. A year later in 2004, USA Today ranked Steve McNair as number three in their list of the 10 toughest athletes in sports, ranking behind only Brett Favre and the NBA's Alvin Iverson. This ranking was well earned as Steve had faced and played through many serious injuries. In February of 2004, he underwent surgery to remove a cracked bone spur in his left ankle. Also in 2004, Steve suffered a blow to the sternum in a game against Jacksonville. The impact caused him to miss a total of eight games, including the final five. In December, the bone from his right hip was grafted into his sternum to fill in an area that contained cartilage instead of bone, a rare pre-existing condition that was discovered with the injury. Steve McNair was well-loved by fans and his team, but not just for his success on the field. For years, every summer, he would host free youth football camps across Nashville and in Mississippi. Mitchell Williams, a Mississippi sports anchor who was close to Steve, told the Tennessean, quote, When Steve started holding his camps, nobody else was doing a whole lot of them. He helped start that trend. Touchable. Just so touchable and approachable and always spending time with those campers. A generation of young people came to Steve's camps. He also founded the Steve McNair Foundation, which provided funding to different youth charities and groups in his home state of Mississippi and his adopted state of Tennessee. It was a huge blow to Tennessee fans when in 2006, after 11 seasons, the Titans traded McNair to the Baltimore Ravens, where he would play his final two seasons before announcing his plans for retirement in 2007. 
After facing a multitude of injuries and wanting to make more time for his family, the former Titan was ready for a change. Steve had spent a lot of his off-season time on his 645-acre ranch in Mount Olive, where he owned 200 head of cattle and 20 horses. When people think of the football great, that's not really the picture they see, but his friends knew he was a country boy at heart. He had a place in Hendersonville near Nashville, where he went fishing when he was in town. And now he was ready to spend more time with all of his sons, splitting his time between homes in Nashville, the ranch in Mount Olive, and a home in Collins, Mississippi. He wanted to be able to see their games, take them fishing, and make sure they had a loving father in their lives, probably because he knew how much he missed having his father in his own life. And Steve also wanted to get into some business ventures. He and Michelle had bought a 13,000-square-foot home in Nashville when Steve was with the Titans, and after his retirement, he opened a restaurant called Gridiron 9 on Jefferson Street in honor of his jersey number. His partners in the venture were his longtime assistant, Raymond White, and his sometime bodyguard and friend, Robert Gaddy. The restaurant was designed to offer affordable dining close to Tennessee State University, a historically black college in the heart of Nashville. About the restaurant, former team member, Titans running back, and football great Eddie George said, quote, He established his business in the heart of the black community over at TSU to have a strong and powerful impact. Steve McNair was still a young man when he retired at age 34 and had dreams of creating a chain of these restaurants, but he never got the chance. Just two years later, he would be gone. I'm going to pause now to hear a word from today's sponsors. While Steve McNair was certainly a remarkable man, dedicated to his family, teammates, and community, he wasn't a perfect man. The womanizing he was so well known for in college never really stopped. There weren't any reports of an unhappy marriage between Steve and Michelle, though their home in the upscale Green Hills neighborhood was up for sale in 2009. Steve also had a bachelor's pad in the city. The lease was actually in his friend Wayne Neely's name. Neely would later say that Steve asked him to rent the condo for a private place to chill. Michelle moved her mother into their Green Hills mansion because she was lonely, creating more friction for the couple as Steve often fled for the condo to get some privacy. Wayne Neely worked at a Nashville sporting goods store and had been a friend of Steve's for a decade, as long as he had been married to Michelle. He had a key, and it's been said the men shared the condo, while other reports say it was just in his name. And this is the condo where Steve brought at least two women he was seeing in 2009. One of these women was Sahel Jenny Kazami. Born in Iran, Kazami preferred to go by her American name, Jenny. She was 19 years old and worked as a server at Dave & Buster's in the Opry Mills Mall. She was bubbly, outgoing, and someone her co-workers later said they could rely on, not just as a co-worker, but as a friend. Jenny's personality masked her painful childhood. When she was nine years old, living in Tehran, she was spending the night at her older sister's home when her mother was murdered. She was killed during a home invasion robbery. Jenny's older sister took custody of Jenny, as their father was not involved in their lives. They continued to live in Iran until Jenny was 13 years old. After her 13th birthday, Jenny and her family moved to Turkey for a short time before immigrating to the United States and settling in Florida in 2002. Jenny attended high school in Jacksonville for a few years until she dropped out. In 2005, at 16 years old, she followed a 20-year-old guy named Keith Norfleet to Nashville. They had only dated briefly before moving in together, but they both got jobs in the service industry and were together until December of 2008, the same month that Jenny met Steve McNair as he happened to sit in her section at Dave & Buster's. She was 19, he was 35, but despite the age difference, they seemed to hit it off instantly. It wasn't long before Jenny was staying at Steve's condo, and the two were spending a lot of time together while he still managed his home life with Michelle and the kids. 
The romance with Jenny was a whirlwind of fancy dinners, clubbing in the city, and lavish vacations. And while the public wasn't initially aware, Steve didn't seem particularly concerned with keeping the affair private. All of Jenny's friends knew and saw her with Steve. They would later insist it was a real relationship, that they were in love. Within a couple of months, Jenny had even introduced Steve to her family. Jenny's roommate later told police that Jenny wasn't working much, and she kept warning her friend not to get too dependent on McNair, but Jenny wouldn't listen. They were taking trips to Vegas and the Keys. TMZ easily got photos of the two on vacation in the Keys. Steve really wasn't trying to hide anything at this point. Jenny also claimed to her boss that Steve took her home to Mississippi to meet his family. She told her family and friends that Steve was planning to divorce Michelle soon and marry her. She said they were waiting on the sale of their Green Hills home. On her 20th birthday in May, Steve put down a deposit on a black Cadillac Escalade and co-signed the note. Jenny insisted on making the payment on her own, though, telling friends she wanted to maintain her independence. But friends of Steve's insist that while he helped her get the luxury SUV, he made sure she knew that the payments were her responsibility. She gave her own car, a Kia, to her friend, Christy Randolph. But Christy never officially took over the car payments. She made them for a while and then abandoned the car in a Walgreens parking lot leaving Jenny stuck with two car notes now. By June, Steve and Jenny had been seeing each other for about six months. But early that month, Jenny saw another woman, not Michelle, leaving Steve's condo. Later, one detective who had worked the case said that while Steve was messy in his love life, he wouldn't have invited Jenny over so close to when the other woman was leaving. He felt that Jenny was already suspicious in watching the condo. Jenny could take being the other woman. After all, Steve allegedly promised her that he was going to divorce Michelle and marry her. But seeing this new woman drove her over the edge. Jenny grilled Steve about this other woman in his life, but he kept assuring her that nothing was going on. Typical gaslighting from a cheater. Early in May, Steve had started seeing this other woman named Leah Ignogni. They met on Cinco de Mayo. They spent most nights at Leah's apartment in the Gulch, a trendy neighborhood on the southern fringe of downtown, but they did occasionally stay at Steve's place. Before Jenny spotted Leah at the condo, neither of the women knew about each other. Jenny began stalking Leah, following her around the city, to the point that Leah noticed and reported to the police that a black Escalade had been following her and showing up on her street multiple times a day. When Leah later talked to the police, she said Steve said a lot of the same stuff to her. That he and Michelle were divorcing, their house was for sale, and he told her he loved her and wanted to be together. But Leah seemed much more canny to the real situation. She told police that her friends even called his condo a trap house, where athletes just took women for sex. She said the condo didn't look lived in, and she had found a tampon in the trash. Leah seemed to know this was just a hookup despite what Steve was telling her, but she was unnerved by the black Escalade following her around. Jenny's financial problems were escalating along with her emotions. She hadn't been working much, and the bill collectors were calling. Her roommate had grown tired of the situation and moved out, and then Jenny also got behind on her rent. Her roommate, Emily Andrews, later spoke with the police. She had moved back to her hometown of Philadelphia. Jenny was stressed out about the rent and wanted Emily to pay her half for another month. Emily had said that she would pay, but deduct 200 that Jenny had borrowed from her. So the friendship was icy for a bit, but Emily told the police that they were patching things up. By July 3rd, they were missing each other's phone calls, but sending friendly messages. Emily said she had believed Steve was leaving his wife initially. Jenny told her they were looking at houses but it became evident that Jenny was over-relying on Steve for money, and Emily began to doubt the seriousness of the relationship. Jenny's friend Christy said the same thing. She actually said that Jenny manipulated Steve for money and laughed about it later. She would call him crying or text him that she was desperate for money. 
he would transfer her the money, and then Jenny would take Christy shopping. So when Jenny saw the other woman, she wasn't just jealous. She was worried about money if Steve stopped helping her. On July 1st, 2009, Jenny found used condoms in the bathroom trash at Steve's condo. Her suspicions were confirmed. Later that day, during her shift at Dave & Buster's, Jenny was reportedly despondent. That afternoon, her manager noticed Jenny spending an hour of her shift speaking with an unknown black man. Sometime later, she clocked out for her 30-minute break, but failed to return until two hours later, close to 7 p.m. Jenny claimed she had gotten a flat tire while she was on break, and that's why she was gone so long. But she didn't call in while she was supposedly dealing with a flat tire, so her manager sent her home for the night. Later that night, Steve met Jenny at the Corner Pub, a sports bar on Fifth Avenue. But instead of the intimate drink Jenny was hoping for, Steve also invited his friend and chef at his restaurant, Casper Gordon. After drinking for a couple of hours, they left at around 1 a.m. Even though Jenny had been drinking heavily, she drove while Steve and Casper rode in the back seat of her Escalade. She was speeding through the downtown streets of Nashville, and Casper later said they kept telling her to slow down before they saw the blue lights. They were pulled over, and Jenny refused to take a breathalyzer test. You can see her doing the DUI walking test on YouTube. She's clearly trashed, and she was arrested and taken to jail. Steve and Casper got off lucky as the cop let them call a cab. In 2007, Steve had been in another car pulled over for DUI and was charged as a passenger, though the charge was dropped in less than a month. This Nashville cop was willing to let him slide, though they were all intoxicated. Steve actually called his usual cab driver to pick him and Casper up as Jenny sat in the back of the patrol car, begging the officer to let her talk to Steve. The officer told her he asked Steve to come to the car and he declined. But Steve did go bail her out within an hour. Meanwhile, Leah was waiting for Steve at her apartment. She hadn't wanted to go out that night, and so he told her he would come by her place later that evening. It would wind up being much later. After filling out the bond paperwork and getting Jenny released, it was after three in the morning. The cab driver had waited around with Casper asleep in the car waiting too. They both later said that Jenny was angry and yelling at Steve when they dropped her off at her apartment. Her ex-boyfriend, Keith Norfleet, later told police that there was pounding on his door around that same time that night, and he thought it was Jenny, but he didn't answer it because he had another girl in his apartment but it was probably because he was pissed at Jenny. I think it's important to note that while Jenny was seemingly in free fall, she was still stringing along her ex. She had even called him from jail that night and asked him to go pick up her Escalade. He went riding around looking for it with a friend. He found it, but didn't have the keys, so he asked a nearby police officer what he should do, and the officer told him that Jenny's boyfriend had been in the car that night. Norfleet reportedly said, what boyfriend? And the cop said, are you familiar with the NFL? Jenny had been telling Keith that she and Steve broke up, but were still hanging out. He was even helping her with money. Keith was the man she had followed from Jacksonville to Nashville. They had been together for almost four years. There was real history there. But back to the timeline. Steve showed up at Leah's apartment around 4 a.m. apologizing and explaining that he had to bail out a friend for a DUI. He even told her Jenny's name. But he left again by 6 a.m. to go open his restaurant. It was now July 2nd. After he went to the restaurant, Steve went out to a place he had in Hendersonville to relax and fish. And Jenny went back to her ex-boyfriend. This time, she told him the truth about her relationship with McNair and she used his computer to post some of her furniture on Craigslist. She was really desperate for money. Keith would later say he was going to try and help her sell the Kia or make the payments. Jenny and Steve didn't see each other that day. After Steve spent the day in Hendersonville, he was back at Leah's apartment by 10.30 that night, and he spent the night with her. But Jenny started texting him in the early morning hours of July 3rd, wanting to talk about their relationship. In the messages, Steve does tell her he loves her. He seems to be trying to either string her along or keep her calm. 
I think he was ready to break it off, but knew she was volatile and could cause him a lot of trouble. Jenny sent one message saying, I'm going to have all of you soon. And Steve replied, yes, you will. By eight that morning, Steve asked Jenny if she was awake and if she had stayed in the condo that night. She was awake and said she was at the condo. She told him she was going to meet some people about selling her furniture later that day. It seems like he was trying to see if it was safe for him to return to the condo yet. Soon, Jenny sent him a panicked text saying, Baby, I might have a breakdown. I'm so stressed. She was worried about her bills and needed money. She asked him to transfer $2,000 into her account, and Steve agreed and transferred the money. She spent a lot of the afternoon on July 3rd texting Steve, begging him to spend time with her. He kept blowing her off, trying to explain that he was with his family, playing with his sons in the swimming pool. Eventually, he stopped answering her. She sent him a text saying, Baby, I have to be with you tonight. I don't care where, and got no response. She then texted, Tell me you going to be with me. Again, Steve didn't text back. Later that evening, during her shift at Dave & Buster's, Jenny told her shift manager, Sonia New, all about her problems with McNair, her DUI, her living situation, and money problems. Sonia thought it was unusual. Jenny didn't usually unload like that. She told Sonia, My life is just shit and I should end it. Shortly before the end of the night, she perked up some after she made plans with another co-worker to see the fireworks for the 4th of July celebration the next day. Jenny tried to get in touch with Steve again as her shift ended. This time, he answered and explained that he was at home having trouble getting his 10- and 5-year-old boys to sleep. But really, Steve was out drinking with friends. Jenny got off work and went back to the condo to wait for Steve. She dressed in a pink shorty lingerie set. It wasn't until 1 a.m. that Steve texted her and told her to leave the front door unlocked for him as he was headed home, driven by his usual cab driver. Sometime between 1.15 and 1.30 a.m. on the 4th of July, he finally arrived at the condo. I'm going to pause now to hear a final word from today's sponsors. As families were grilling out and preparing to go watch the fireworks show at the Cumberland River later, Wayne Neely decided to stop by the condo because he had been calling Steve but hadn't heard back from him and was worried. It was around 1 p.m. when he walked inside, and at first, he thought Steve and Jenny were asleep in the darkened apartment. He walked to the fridge and opened a beer before he turned on the light and saw the horror in the living room. Steve McNair's bloody body was on the couch. He had been shot multiple times twice in the head and twice in the chest. Sahel Jenny Kazemi's body was lying on the floor below. She had been shot once in the head. But Neely ran out, not even knowing that it was Steve's body he had seen. In shock, Neely first called Raymond Smith, Steve's assistant, but he didn't answer, so he called Robert Gaddy, a friend of Steve's, instead of calling 911. Gaddy came running over and found Neely waiting by his truck. Wayne Neely even called a judge he knew, who advised him to call 911 immediately and tell the police everything. Still, 45 minutes had now passed since Wayne had walked into the condo before he called 911. A lot would be made of this gap later. But to be honest, we've seen this before with celebrity deaths. Friends often feel protective and want to hide anything embarrassing to their famous friend whether it's drugs, photos, guns, anything. There's no evidence that Neely took anything from the scene. He certainly may have considered it, or he may have just been freaked out. However, Robert Gaddy did have some motive to take things from the scene. Multiple friends later described a falling out he had with his business partners, Steve and Raymond White. Six-foot-four, 300-pound Robert Big Daddy Gaddy was a club promoter and he had asked Steve to borrow $10,000 for another venture. Steve had said no. There are conflicting reports. Some said that Gaddy took the cash out of the safe at Gridiron 9. Others said he wrote a check from their business account. As co-owners, it took all three signatures. But Steve and Raymond typically let Gaddy handle day-to-day business at the restaurant, 
and it wasn't unusual for them to sign a blank check. In this story, Getty wrote himself a $13,000 check. Doc Simpson would later point out that Gaddy, who had played football with Steve at Alcorn State and was a long-term friend and business partner, did not serve as pallbearer at his funeral. He seemed locked out of all funeral arrangements. And supposedly, Steve's brother Tim even confronted him and asked him if he had anything to do with his brother's death. Steve was found with only 6 or $7 in his pocket, and friends said that was highly unusual. I really didn't think it was that big of a deal until I read and heard so many interviews of how Steve always kept about 2000 in cash rolled up in $100 bills in his pocket. He would send a friend into a store to get a cold drink and then refuse the change. He only kept hundreds, he said. So I think it's possible in that gap of time from when Gaddy got to the condo and when Wayne Neely called the police that Gaddy had gone in and searched Steve's pockets. Steve also usually wore a platinum Rolex, but it wasn't found on his body. Raymond Smith and Steve's other bodyguard named Chris Wall claimed there had been a safe at the condo that was also now missing. But police did not log any missing or stolen items in their report. It's likely because there was no real proof of the cash Steve carried or of the safe. In the police report, Steve was found wearing a gray shirt, blue jean shorts, blue boxer shorts, with his wallet in his pocket. No mention is made of a watch, missing or otherwise. It's possible they just didn't know and this detail came out later. Either way, within five minutes, police officers swarmed the scene. Detectives at the scene found Jenny's body on the floor at the feet of McNair, with a gun under her body. Her blood was on McNair's shorts and shirt, indicating that she had slipped down his body after she shot herself. The carpet beneath her body was soaked in blood from the wound in her head, and the couch was covered in McNair's blood. Her body lay over her hands and the gun. There was a perfect impression of the gun and the blood in the carpet, which meant the bodies had not been moved after the final shot to Jenny's right temple. Investigators at the scene were quick to label Steve McNair's death a homicide and suspected it was a murder-suicide. Despite this, they investigated the case fully, involving a group of cold case detectives from the Metro Police Department to help uncover what had really happened in the early hours of July 4, 2009. Traces of gunpowder were found on Jenny's left hand, but not her right hand. Much would be made of this later. The gun was traced back to an ex-con named Adrian Gilliam. He had recently met Jenny Kazami, and phone records showed several calls and texts between the two of them in the days leading up to the deaths. Gilliam told police that earlier in the week on July 1st, the night Jenny had been late getting back to her shift at Dave & Buster's, she had asked him to meet her at her apartment. She wanted to buy a gun. He showed her the gun he had and even showed her how to use it, but she didn't buy it from him then. As the calls and texts went back and forth by July the 3rd, Jenny texted Gilliam and told him to bring her the gun. He met her in the parking lot of Dave & Buster's and sold her a 9mm handgun for $100. Later, Jenny's co-workers would identify Adrian Gilliam as the black man they didn't know talking to her during her shift on July 1st, before she took that long, unexplained break and was sent home early. In the three weeks before her death, there would be 45 calls and 162 text messages between Jenny and Adrian Gilliam. He would first tell police that he barely knew her and just sold her the gun because he really needed the cash. In the Dave & Buster's parking lot, he pulled the clip out of the gun, put it back in, and showed Jenny how to use it. He said the gun was fully loaded when he bought it for himself and it was still fully loaded when he sold it to Jenny. During her shift on July 3rd, Jenny and Gilliam spoke several times over the phone. He even explained to her again how to use the gun. Later that night, at 1.17 a.m., Gilliam texted Jenny asking, You good? To which there was no reply. He tried again at 7.30 in the morning of the 4th and got no reply. By that afternoon, when news of Steve McNair's murder broke, Adrian Gilliam realized who Jenny was. He was panicked. He knew the gun would send him back to prison. He would later insist to the police that he didn't know why she wanted the gun and didn't know she dated Steve McNair. 
While investigating Gilliam, detectives involved in the case also spoke with Jenny's friends, co-workers, and family to learn more about her. Her nephew told police that she had struggled with behavioral issues during her teenage years. Jenny Kazemi is often portrayed as this tiny girl, five foot two inches tall, weighing around 110. Conspiracy theorists have argued that there's no way she could have handled that gun to kill Steve. She's also portrayed as happy and bubbly, but she also had a dark side. Her friend, Christy Randolph, who spoke with journalist Tom Rowan, said that Jenny could be a really cold person. And when Christy asked her about it, Jenny said she had watched her father murder her mother as a child. Jenny's family vehemently denied this story. Jenny's mother was killed in a home invasion. It's possible she just made up the story. We often forget that she was just 19 when she met Steve, basically a teenager. And she had been a teenager with a lot of problems. Her nephew briefly mentioned behavioral problems in his interview with police, but Sports Illustrated requested her juvenile records and talked to her sister. Jenny ran away from home in 2004 at age 15. She wound up at a youth crisis center where a counselor said that she told him she had tried to kill herself with pills. This has been another huge point with conspiracy theorists, and especially Jenny's friends, that she was not suicidal. Sonia knew, her manager who gave the police that quote from Jenny, that her life was shit and she should end it, would later tell Sports Illustrated that the quote was taken out of context. She said there was a pause, and she took it to mean that Jenny was going to end the relationship with Steve, but she said she never went back and clarified this with the police. She said she didn't think they would believe her, and she'd also gotten a lot of blowback from Dave and Busters. Lots of celebrities like the Titans players ate there. They didn't want to be in the news for this. I'm not really sure what to make of Sonia. She seems genuine in her interview with Sports Illustrated, but I have to admit that many friends flocked to the news and that podcast to discuss Jenny, most of them validating the conspiracy theories that Jenny wasn't suicidal, that she wasn't jealous or violent, that she didn't know how to use a gun. Well, Jenny did in fact have a history of violence. She was arrested for domestic violence in Florida in February of 2005 when she hit her sister over the head with a hairbrush, causing a deep laceration. Her sister later confirmed that her bad behavior had escalated to aggression and became physical. And was she the jealous type? Her friend Christy said yes, absolutely. She said when she broke up with Keith Norfleet, she knew all of his social media passwords and stalked his private messages. Christy said that she even went to the home of a girl he was talking to, planning to beat her up. But the girl had a friend with her, and Jenny was the one who wound up getting jumped. Some of the jealousy with Steve does seem a tad strange when you hear of the other men she was seeing. She had also allegedly dated other Tennessee Titans, Vince Young and Quentin Gaither, both of whom denied the relationship. But in those three weeks before her death, She called Gaither six times and texted with him 255 times. I think it's safe to say they were at least talking, flirting. And she was still talking to her ex-boyfriend, Keith Norfleet. During that same time period, she had called him 85 times and texted him 177 times. One of Jenny's sisters admitted to ESPN that she knew Jenny was angry about McNair's other relationship, but said, quote, She was cheating too. She said, I was faithful to him. If he's going to do that, I'm going to do the same. So maybe she was trying to make Steve jealous. Sleeping with his former teammates might be a way to do that, but not with a man like Steve McNair. He was a womanizer, and though he constantly told Jenny he loved her, he didn't seem to care what else she did or who else she saw. It was all talk for him. And for context, Her calls and texts with Steve McNair were excessive in comparison to the other men. 127 calls and 447 texts. Think about how many times a day or week that you text your husband or wife. This was excessive. Jenny was spiraling. In an interview with Jenny's ex-boyfriend, Keith Norfleet, he told the police that in the days leading up to the murder, Jenny was upset and stressed. He said, quote, I know she was stressed out. I know Jenny, and she's never been stressed out like that before. He went on to say, quote, 
It felt like there was something else, and I always asked her if there was something else you want to talk about. He said she told him that she wanted to tell Michelle McNair about the affair, and he told her that was a bad idea. She and Keith started hanging out again after this until her DUI, when he realized that she really was still with Steve. Keith Norfleet was interviewed extensively by the authorities. They looked into his relationship with Jenny Kazami, paying special attention to the days leading up to July 4th, including why the two had kept in touch after their breakup six months before. Norfleet explained that he and Jenny had stayed in touch, but that the relationship had not been romantic after their breakup. He also told the police that he still looked after Jenny, trying to help her with money, giving her a shoulder to lean on. Wayne Neely was also the subject of several headlines because of those 45 minutes he waited to call 911, but ultimately, he was investigated extensively and cleared by investigators. As was Robert Gaddy. Famed Nashville detective Pat Pastiglione was interviewed, along with another investigator on the case, Charles Robinson. They said that Gaddy acknowledged the rift about the money, but downplayed the seriousness. And they just kind of left it at that, which seems fishy until you remember that Steve McNair was a millionaire. The rift over a few thousand dollars would have been settled if he had lived. It's not like he was broke. Just four days later, on July 8th, Nashville Police Chief Ron Serpis held a press conference and confirmed to the public that Jenny Kazami had shot Steve McNair in his sleep before turning the gun on herself. The totality of the evidence clearly points to a murder-suicide, he said. The medical examiner, Dr. Fang Lee, agreed. Serpus said, McNair was seated on the sofa and was likely asleep, and we believe that Kazami shot him in the right temple, then shot him twice in the chest, and then shot him a final time in the left temple. He went on to explain Jenny's suicide. Quote, Kazami then positioned herself next to McNair on the sofa and shot herself once in the right temple. We do believe she tried to stage that. When she killed herself, she would fall in his lap. Though the police were waiting on toxicology and other reports, Chief Serpis told reporters that a trace of gunshot residue was found on Kazemi's left hand. Chief Serpis briefly explained the affair gone wrong, saying in the week before the deaths, Kazemi had found out that McNair was seeing another woman and had been distraught, telling at least two people that she wanted to end her life. He said that evidence clearly showed the young woman was spiraling out of control. Sahel Jenny Kazami's funeral was held in Jacksonville, Florida on July 10, 2009. It was a small funeral with just friends and family in attendance. Steve McNair's funeral was held on Saturday, July 11th in Mississippi. Football greats Brett Favre, Jay Cutler, and Ray Lewis attended the service. Over 5,000 mourners, friends, family, and fans visited the Reed Green Coliseum at the University of Southern Mississippi to pay their respects to Steve McNair. McNair's family had even set up shuttles to bus people to the arena from Mount Olive, where McNair was born and raised. Coach Jeff Fisher led the mourners in the Lord's Prayer. Vince Young, then a player for the Titans, and someone that McNair had mentored as a young man spoke at the service saying, quote, Steve was like a hero to me, and heroes are not supposed to die. Young's speech was echoed throughout the nation, especially in the Titans fandom and NFL world in the wake of McNair's death. Headlines of every major news source discussed McNair's murder, his infidelity, and the complete disbelief at how the toughest man in football's life had come to an end. Tabloids exposed the details of Kazami and McNair's relationship, including dissecting the couple's text messages, Facebook photos, and rumors that swirled around the case. Other past teammates had much to say following McNair's death. Former Titans wide receiver Derek Mason said, quote, He did as much as he possibly could to help the community. He was like, he has no enemies. Who would want to do that to him? This guy would give you the shirt off his back. So who would want to murder him the way they did? And then obviously stuff started to come out and whatnot, but still, you're in disbelief that even what you're hearing and how it happened, happened. Eddie George told the Tennessean, I'm pretty sure that he was dealing with some things we don't know about. When you transition from the game, 
mentally and physically and emotionally transition. You go through so much change. Just imagine going from what you do every day and all of a sudden you're forced into doing something different. He was probably searching for something, things in the wrong places. George went on to say, I would have loved to see what he could have blossomed into as a businessman, as a philanthropist, as a man of God. And I choose to focus on the good times, the great memories. Although the Nashville police have been criticized for closing the case so quickly, they actually didn't officially close the case until December of that year. There were hundreds of man hours spent, countless interviews. I found a 185-page police report, which was partly redacted, but it shows how long and extensive the investigation was. Regardless, not everyone was convinced with the investigation's outcome. Former Nashville police officer Vincent Hill began investigating the case on his own. According to Hill, he did not suspect Kazemi was the killer. He noted specifically that McNair had only $6 in his pocket when his body was discovered, which, according to friends, was out of ordinary for him. He also points to inconsistencies between Adrian Gilliam's interviews with police, the man that had sold Kazemi the gun used in the murder. Gilliam's alibi was shaky. The man who lived in the place he claimed to be denied seeing him that night. But Nashville police found that Gilliam's cell phone pinged off Smyrna Towers during the time of the murder-suicide. When journalist Tim Rowan followed up on this because Vincent Hill kept saying that the cell phone evidence was ridiculous because Gilliam could have just ditched the phone, the detectives pointed out that they didn't just look at the cell tower pings. They checked the contacts on his phone. They were all regular contacts Gilliam spoke to, and they followed up with these people. He did have an alibi. He just probably had some other illegal reason for claiming to be at a friend's house instead. Despite Hill's claims, the Metro Police Department stands by its investigation and conclusion in the case. In response to Hill's claims, which made their way through the media, a spokesman for the Metro Police spoke to ESPN about the history of Hill's time while working for the department. This history included four and a half years of service riddled with multiple disciplinary issues and reprimands, including disobeying his higher-ups, and he had never investigated a homicide. But despite this, because he made so much noise and upset the McNair family, they entertained Vincent Hill and convened a grand jury. If he could convince a grand jury, they would reopen the case. Hill submitted a messy nine-page letter and a packet of emails. The grand jury declined to reopen the case. But Vincent Hill wouldn't stop and his suspicions led to many conspiracy theories. Katina Fiesel, McNair's high school sweetheart and the mother of his first child, Steve Jr., also told ESPN that she wanted the case reopened, stating, I can't see how Kazemi did this perfect shooting for one thing. First time using a gun? I think there's much missing in this case. A true crime special with Aphrodite Jones on McNair's murder aired in 2013. The special pointed suspicion at McNair's wife, Michelle, though she was never even considered a suspect in her husband's death. And if that wasn't shitty enough, in 2016, Michelle had to file a lawsuit against Vincent Hill and the news show Crime Watch Daily for showing up at her home and ambushing her youngest son who answered the door. They kept recording as Trent called his mom to the door and she asked the cameraman to stop filming multiple times before he finally stopped. Then, according to the lawsuit, a correspondent, quote, maliciously suggested in the presence of minor children that Michelle McNair was concealing the truth about the death of her husband. Vincent Hill was also there and indicated that he knew the truth about what happened to Steve McNair. The crew aggressively kept at the family until Trent slammed the door on them and ran to his bedroom crying. Michelle sued for trespassing, invasion of privacy, and emotional distress of her two young sons. She made sure that footage wasn't broadcast. The case was eventually settled privately. Vincent Hill would later say this incident embarrassed him and he would apologize to Michelle if he could. I call bullshit. He always says he's not in it for the money, but he self-published two books outright accusing Adrian Gilliam of Steve's murder, along with many other wild rumors and theories. He desperately wants the notoriety and the money. You can't convince me otherwise. 
He approached Lucille McNair, got her to hire him as a private investigator, and in my opinion, hurt that poor woman even more with his lies and conspiracy theories. It took years for Lucille to accept the truth. Vincent Hill would go on to participate in that long-form podcast called Fall of a Titan, sponsored by Sports Illustrated. And to his credit, in every episode, journalist Tim Rowan points out the many inconsistencies of Vincent Hill and how he isn't fully trustworthy. It's hard to understand why he actually built his podcast around this man. But fans of Steve McNair had long wanted a deep-dive investigation by a journalist. There were so many ugly rumors. Probably the worst was the rumor that Steve McNair had been castrated and his penis was stuffed in his mouth. This is absolutely not true. The coroner was interviewed again for that podcast and denied the rumor twice on record, and the official autopsy report noted, quote, McNair genitalia without trauma. Many people, most of all Vincent Hill and journalist Tim Rowan, railed against the Nashville Police Department for not releasing crime scene photos. Tennessee passed a law called Postmortem Examination Act. It means that only the next of kin can give permission to release crime scene photos. Of course, Michelle McNair wouldn't want those photos released. Her sons would see them online. It's a ludicrous argument and would prove nothing. I saw the police report and medical examiner notes, including drawings. That rumor was hurtful and completely untrue. What's so bad about this rumor is that it was so widespread Doc Simpson felt he had to tell Lucille, Mama Mac McNair, before she heard it elsewhere. Then she insisted on seeing the crime scene photos for herself, and the Nashville PD insisted they showed her all of them. What they refused to do was make copies for her, per Tennessee law. People have long claimed that the Nashville police were involved in a cover-up, but that's absurd. The 185-page document I saw was not falsified. It would have involved so many different officials who definitely would not have risked their careers, not for any imaginary payout that conspiracy theorists believe. An enduring argument that won't go away is how could petite Jenny Kazami kill a six foot three, 200 pound athlete like Steve McNair? Okay, if they were in the middle of an argument, I could understand what people are saying. It's hard to hit a moving target, and he could have taken the gun away from her. But he was asleep on the couch. One of his wounds was a contact shot to his left temple. All she had to do was sneak up on Steve, who had a blood alcohol of 0.15, twice the legal limit, who was sleeping, put the gun to his head, and pulled the trigger. After that, his wounds were estimated to be from two to three feet from his body. She stood over him and kept firing. It was overkill. And it was personal. And Adrian Gilliam admitted he showed Jenny how to fire the gun. People argue that GSR was only found on her left hand, not her dominant right hand. Well, that is very simply explained in the police report and by detectives and the coroner. After she killed Steve, she sat in his lap and pointed the gun to her right temple. She had hoped to be found in his lap, but she slid down in the blood and fell on top of the gun and her hands. Only her left hand could be partially tested for GSR. Her right hand was covered completely in blood, and any residue would have been washed away. Finally, they ask why she was dressed up in pink lingerie if she planned to kill him. And to that, I ask, why wasn't Steve found in the bed instead of on the couch? I think Jenny planned to confront Steve that night, meet him at the door, looking her best, and gave him an ultimatum about their relationship. She wanted him to stop seeing other women, finally divorce Michelle, and be with her. I think Steve finally told her no, or at the very least, he refused to talk to her and blew her off, choosing to sleep on the couch instead of going to bed with her. Enraged, Jenny Kazami got the gun and did what she had been planning to do. Friends and family say that's not the girl they knew. But how many times do you hear that about a murderer on true crime shows? Most ordinary people do not expect this kind of violence to enter their lives. And Kazemi did have a troubled past, a violent past, a past that include jealousy and stalking. Her world was closing in. Her roommate had moved out. She got screwed over and had two car payments. And she could feel Steve, the man who had been taking care of her, drifting away. I think it really was that simple. 
Occam's razor, y'all. The simplest answer is usually the right one. And I agree with the highly decorated detectives on this case. All evidence points to Sahel Jenny Kazemi. I could go on for another hour about all of the conspiracies that Vincent Hill and others have cooked up, but I just don't believe them, and the painful gossip doesn't stop there. The other rumors and controversy that have plagued the McNair family in the years following Steve's murder are because he died without a will. His assets were immediately frozen. Michelle had to file a petition with the probate judge to withdraw enough money from his accounts to pay quarterly taxes to prevent from having to pay interest and delinquency fees. She was also able to secure $500,000 for each of his four sons until probate was settled. A few short months after Steve's death, his restaurant was sold off. For a long time, his estates in both Tennessee and Mississippi were in probate. Before his murder, McNair had three different wills drawn up at different times, but he had never signed one of them. This put his family in a real predicament when it came to dividing up the estate. Throughout his football career, McNair had made a salary of around $90 million, had multiple properties, and several endorsement deals. However, his assets, as filed with probate, were listed in total at just under $20 million. He told several friends before his death that he had made a huge investment and lost. I think if anyone really wanted to look at a conspiracy, a forensic accounting of Steve's fortune wouldn't be out of line. A lot of people want to know what happened to all that money. But Steve did live high on the hog and was generous to a fault. Maybe it was just a bad investment and poor money management. In 2011, the media reported that Michelle and Steve's mother, Lucille, had gotten into a legal battle over the ranch in Mississippi the land and house Steve had given his mother. Without a will, all of Steve's properties went to all of his living heirs, his wife and his four sons. So they each had a 20% share in the ranch. The media said that Michelle charged Lucille 3000 in rent, and then Lucille had to move out because she couldn't afford it. And indeed, in March of 2011, Michelle filed documents with the court asking Lucille to pay rent. But it's more complicated than that. Buzz Cook, Steve McNair's longtime agent and friend, explained how probate worked. All five heirs would have to agree to keep or sell any assets. He said that the court had the responsibility of protecting the interests of Steve's minor children. Katina Fiesel said her lawyer urged her to sign the papers to sell the ranch because the upkeep of the ranch would be divided up between Steve's heirs, meaning her son, Steve Jr.'s trust, which was only 20% of his estate, would be responsible for the ranch, so she signed. The house and land sold for $1.4 million and was put into the five trusts. No matter how badly you feel for Lucille McNair, when you see it put that way, it does change things. Steve's sons would be responsible for the taxes and upkeep on her house. That's why she was asked to pay the rent. It didn't work out, and that sucks but none of the hurt and ugliness would have happened if Steve had simply signed a will. All of the later drama between his mother and wife, and even his first two sons and wife, could have been avoided. But Steve was 36 years old. It's hard to think about dying when you're that young. But with his considerable wealth, it was irresponsible. I read one article where a former NFL player said the league typically set up new players with wealth management attorneys after they signed. So it is strange. But as Buzz Cook, his agent, said, Steve was a man of his own mind. He did what he wanted with his money and rarely consulted his CPA or attorneys. Buzz Cook is another controversial figure. He is the one who said there was a will, but it was never signed. However, he has categorically refused to disclose what was in that will. People see nefarious reasons for this. As in, if Steve was planning a divorce, he might have written Michelle out. But he died without signing it or divorcing her. It's entirely possible that Buzz Cook is simply looking after his friend's family. He doesn't want them embarrassed. The simple truth is, the will and the prenup Michelle signed make no difference in this case. All the details could hurt his family if released to the press. But it was ugly. Lucille wound up paying about $20,000 in rent before she moved to a house across from the ranch. 
the ranch that Steve had built for her. And again, all of this could have been avoided if he had just signed his will. However, both Lucille and Michelle grieved and then moved on with their lives. Lucille had the support of her other sons, grandchildren, and extended family. Fred McNair, the original Air McNair, became head football coach at Alcorn State. It was a nice way of coming full circle at their beloved alma mater, where Fred had earned his bachelor and master's degree. Michelle had a great support system for her sons from former teammates. Mike Moo, referred to as Uncle Mike by her boys, once helped run Steve's foundation. Following his friend's death, he made it a point to be a part of the boys' lives. So did Zach Piller, a defensive lineman who was close to Steve. The men helped Michelle navigate her sons through their own participation with sports in school. Near the 10-year anniversary of her husband's death, Michelle sat down with ESPN to talk about his legacy and her life since his passing. In the interview, she described that after his murder, she would often get asked how she felt, knowing that her husband was having an affair. She explained, quote, I didn't know about her at all. You're going to have people who say, oh, she knew. Did I know about some other people and some other things? Yes. But did I know about her? No, I did not. At the end of the day, that's my husband. I loved him. I still love him. He was human. He made a mistake. Nothing's going to change how I feel about my husband. He took care of us. He loved us. I do know that. She went on to say, regardless of how he left here, I know he loved us. I can't say that I didn't have my bitter moments and that I still don't sometimes. But I'm not going to hell blaming somebody or having the hate and animosity in my heart. I'm not going to do it. I found it kind of sad when I was going over the research that his first two sons are rarely mentioned in stories about Steve's life and legacy. When his jersey, number nine, was retired in September of 2019, his oldest sons claim they were not invited to the ceremony. Michelle denied that claim, saying she gave her contact information to the Titans. Michelle also said she reached out personally a few times to his sons, including the day of the ceremony. It seems that the relationships were just strained, and there wasn't much communication until the 10-year anniversary. Lil Stephen, Steve's second son, was quoted in an article about the Jersey retirement ceremony, and he was also interviewed on the podcast, Fall of a Titan. His quote to WJTV News was similar to his interview. He sounds hurt. Quote, What did we do? What have we done? Such hurt that you feel like you just have to place us aside like we don't matter, our opinions don't matter, that you don't even have the decency to check up on us and see how we're doing. His pain is palpable. But families are complicated, and Steve's oldest sons never lived with him and Michelle when he was alive. They lived in Mississippi, near Lucille. So Michelle never really had a stepmother relationship with his other sons. Despite the legal wranglings over his estate, Michelle does not seem like a malicious person. She made sure his oldest sons were included in that probate filing the same as her own sons. While I truly understand his son's pain, I can also see it from Michelle's side. She didn't really know his other sons, but she did her best to make sure they were taken care of. And thankfully, Stephen McNair, Steve's second son who gave those interviews, has since graduated from TSU and gone on to grad school at North Carolina A&T. The family drama is truly just another tragic side to this story. A family torn apart by murder, money, and controversy. Michelle said in that ESPN article that she had recently taken her sons to visit with Lucille and their cousins, so it seems at least that part of the family is healing. Tyler and Trent, his sons with Michelle, both played basketball, but felt so much pressure from their father's legacy that they didn't want to play football, despite showing talent. Trent, who was five when his father died, played basketball in high school. Tyler, who went to NYU majoring in biology, decided to focus on dance. It was his dream, and he later said his father would have completely supported him. Steve never pushed his sons into sports. He let them follow their own paths, just like he had followed his own. 
Steve McNair was not only a legend on the field and in the heart of Titans and football fans, he is an icon in Mississippi and Nashville, where he did so much for the communities. After it came out that he had been involved with other women, many tabloids ripped him apart for his infidelities, and several even blamed him for his own death. Ultimately, despite his legacy as a talented athlete, a man who loved his family and gave back to his communities generously, he was still just a man. He had two sons with two other women before he was married, and I don't believe that Michelle went into the relationship blindly. She admitted as much to ESPN. But she wasn't wrong when she said he loved her. And you know what? Maybe Jenny wasn't wrong either. From their text messages, Steve obviously didn't want to hurt her, and he did go home to her that fateful night. But she wanted Steve for herself. Her jealousy and hurt spiraled into rage. The murder-suicide was tragic, but also depressingly common. And that's what hurts his fans the most. It's why the conspiracy theories endure. Many people feel this great man could not have been brought down by something so simple as jealousy. But he was. Steve McNair was a titan on the field, but in life, he was a human, not a god. He made mistakes. And he paid for those mistakes with his life and legacy. I just hope that his mother, wife, and children have all found peace. Because I don't believe there will ever be a time when the controversy of his life doesn't overshadow his extraordinary legacy. And that is what they have to live with. The shadow of a flawed titan. Southern Fried True Crime is produced by me, Erica Kelly. Today's episode was researched and written by me with additional research and writing by Hannah Newcomb. The audio is edited and mixed by Chez Gray of Gray Multimedia. Southern Fried's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio, and the original graphic art is by Coley Horner. As some of you already know, Facebook shut down our lovely group. It happened overnight without warning or explanation, and it happened to many groups. But we have already started a new one, 4,000 people strong. Search for Southern Fried True Crime Fans Discussion Group. We will still be worshiping our patron saint, Dolly Parton, sharing recipes, and in general, being supportive and good to each other. I still intend for it to be a safe and fun corner of Facebook, so the rule is still, no shit ass is allowed. And please remember if you invite friends to the group to make sure they know to answer the security questions. If you enjoyed today's show, don't forget to subscribe, and please tell a friend or rate and review on iTunes. I'm also on most large platforms like Stitcher and Spotify, as well as Stitcher Premium, where you can listen ad-free. If you have any case suggestions, please email southernfriedtruecrime at gmail.com. I do not accept case suggestions on social media private messages. But please feel free to reach out by email. Not only do I get my most interesting and little-known cases from listener suggestions, I love hearing from you guys. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care.